<laughs> okay, I got it. Okay, so E less than zero, we have done many, many times now. There's an orbit right there that's called an ellipse, and we know the equation of it. It's one over rho is equal to some c, one plus the eccentricity cosine phi minus phi naught. And if we plot that, we get this. And as I, Mr. Euler again caught me, the, the two boundary conditions and pin down your constants are closest approach. Did you see the link? Everybody saw the link that I put about the turning points? Remember the question came up with the turning points? Mm -hmm. I put a link in, a, in an announcement that you can go and see how it's analyzed. I didn't want to revisit it this late. I can, figured he can do it as, as so there is one of them's the apogee and one of them's the perigee. And I am sure by the time I retire from this university and no longer teach, I will know which is which. But at the moment, it's always a guessing game. The perigee is the closest one, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to remember that now because it's like parakeet. And where does a parakeet sit? Really close to you on your shoulder. That's how we're going to remember it from now on. Laugh if you laugh if you want. <laughs> oh man why would you do that to me <laughs> now the hated parakeet is the apogee periscope you look through a periscope to see something close that means it's far away yeah yeah so it's all let me just go the parakeet on my shoulder okay you just said that i'm not gonna i refuse to accept it Apogee is angry here. Exactly. So we also have saw uh, with E greater than zero, we saw hyperbola. So we spent a good amount of time on closed orbits and a little bit on the hyperbola, not much. But the hyperbolic paths also exist. And we'll put a scattering center right here. And this is R and so on. Okay, we'll do this this way. So I want to do the next major subject in this class, which is scattering theory. And I will remind you of a triviality, or it seems like a trivia. Am I recording? Yes. It, it's going to provide context for everything we do. A scattering experiment is an experiment. Okay. Because it's an experiment, we have to make sure at the end of the day, our quantities, and I'm going to borrow, although it's not strictly appropriate to the, the uh, material here, but I'm going to say we need everything to be intensive. You've heard me use the example if i have 100 grams of something and you have 200 grams of something there's not much we can say to each other about the material as soon as i divide by the volume i get something that's intensive it's density pressure is an intensive quantity if you double the size of an identical box and put them together the pressure is the same however number particle number is not intensive that's extensive if you double the bar box here and box stick them together you got twice the number What's another intensive quantity? Temperature is another intensive quantity. If you take something at temperature 300K, put it next to another one 300K, slam them together, allow them to exchange energy, still going to be 300K. It's an interesting phenomenon just in passing. The thermodynamics is based, I'm sure you've never heard this, unless you took someone like me to tell you. Thermodynamics is really interesting. Small changes always end up being something extensive times something intensive. The amount of work you do is TDS, temperature times entropy. PDV, intensive times extensive. Mu dn, mu is the chemical potential. If you don't know what that is, it's okay. You'll learn a year for, you'll, we'll be doing it almost a year from today. Almost a year from today, because you're all taking statistical. No, you're not. Yeah, you are. All of you are taking statistical mechanics. All right. So I want to look at what we're going to measure if you have a set of notes in front of you or capable here's what the experimental situation looks like this is simplified so we have a beam coming in through some area and i want to look at this little ring this little ring will uniquely map and this is the impact parameter the distance away the height away from here the center of that ring and this is called S. Coincidentally, I'm doing this in modern physics right now. So if you hear me refer to it as B, it's because I have a different textbook, obviously, there with a different convention. But we're going to call it S here. So the experimental situation 
is a collimated beam. Collimated means like this, well-defined, like down a tube, a system of tubes, okay? Presumably at some well-defined energy. Now you're gonna change that energy over the course of time, but for now we're going to consider at some well-defined energy. We're gonna develop the thing at a well-defined energy. And hopefully if our formalism is robust, we will see that the energy is a, the observables will be a function of energy, okay? It's incident on a target some suitable distance away. And we're going to consider only central potentials. And you will see me say in the notes, I am switching over now to spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates, no longer cylindrical because we're no longer dealing with an ellipse. We have a, a sphere here that's appropriate to the potential and we have something com coming down the z-axis. So it's not all in the plane like this. And if you consider it from a really elementary perspective, what you have is if you had something coming in like this, we know or an orbit like this, we know z was fixed. We could fix it. We see this with planets in motion in the ecliptic plane. However, the particles are coming here and they don't have to scatter in the plane. They could scatter like this. They could scatter like this. They could scatter like this, depending on the impact parameter. So we have to have a sphere and this is going to go and scatter off this thing into some area. Okay. I'm going to use, and it was a struggle because in my head it's different. So I had to look in Goldstein to make sure I was using the right angle. So what we'll have is this, we have a number per unit time. Sometimes you can develop this into, yes, call it, what's your question, Portland? So, uh, so with the configuration of this that you have here, mm -hmm. so it's scattering off of, I would say, the leftmost side, and it's supposed to hit like an area. Okay, let me, let me, let me. We can, we can. So these particles are coming through, right? I'm going to look at just one of them. I'm not going to draw anything, okay? I'm going to draw after. I'm going to get rid of this one too. So I'm just going to look at one of them, Michael, all right? There's a potential here, V of R. Spherically symmetric. Okay. So this will come in. If it's a repulsive potential, it'll do this, right? This one comes in. If it's a repulsive potential and it's anything like the potentials with which we are familiar, let me ask you a quick quiz question. Okay. Let me ask you a question first. My detector will be somewhere up here. And this angle will be theta cap, okay? And then I'm going to, because of the spherical symmetry, it can go anywhere in this ring, right? It could have also done this, depending where the impact parameter is. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? You ready? I'm going to come in this is just intuition building exercise so i come in with this impact parameter and i scatter into the detector over here i'm going to draw arrows on it so you see which path i'm drawing see that path i just drew you see the one below it okay it's going to start to scatter and it's closer to the potential is that going to scatter above or is it going to scatter below that's a good intuition building exercise. Yeah, above. above. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Because I told him it was a repulsive potential, like a Coulomb potential, right? So if you're here and do this, if you're closer, you feel a bigger classical force, right? If you feel a bigger classical force, you'll deflect more. The Rutherford experiment. You ever heard of Rutherford? Rutherford, okay. Carla, what's your question? Amarillo. <laughs> oh, this would be interesting. First one, this one reminds me of the, the Stern Gerlach experiment. That's quite a quite a leap, but go ahead. Second, <laughs> all right, because there's a picture. Yeah. Second thing is that this could be replicated classically as well. It is classical. This is see, this is what happens, the danger of, of doing this now. This is all a classical. This is all a classical calculation. I'll say this later, but since you brought it up, I'm going to address it. 
the classical problem is very different than the quantum mechanical problem. Number one, I can see the projectiles if I really wanted to. I can see them coming out of a tube, pop, 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 one after the other. Also, if you're in a classical situation, these particles coming out of there are localized particles, correct? And generally, if they're coming out of there, um, you can collimate them and know exactly where they are. You can almost uniquely specify the impact parameter. Because I can see, I can put them in a thin tube. I can move the tube. And I can study as a function. That is generally quantum mechanics. In fact, classically, it's not always accessible. In, in the Rutherford experiment, for example, it's a classical calculation. Even though it's a quantum mechanical effect, it works out. It happens to work out because it's the Coulomb force. In a quantum mechanical calculation, as you'll get to at some point, maybe this will help you at the time. You got to throw this out. You got to throw this picture out. The reason you have to throw this picture out is very clear once you under, once you've thought about it for 30 something years. As soon as you <laughs> it's kind of a discouraging comment in a way to make, but, <laughs> but but no, it doesn't take that long if somebody like me comes along and tells you the problem. In your head, these particles are coming. Because you know they're particles in a tube, right? Somewhere there's a high energy experiment where part guys are shooting electrons and protons down these tubes. In your head, they're they're electrons with a well-defined momentum localized in that tube here's the issue you'll never get the scattering right if you do it that way because how should you be treating those particles in that tube you should be treating those particles in the tube as an incident wave front see and in fact if you think about a proton you say well the proton's in a one centimeter tube here's a one centimeter tube that's 10 to the minus two meters right 10 to the minus two meters so if the proton's 10 to the minus if it's in the tube 10 to the minus two meters what does he experience his Size is on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So there's a 10 to the power 13 meter factor gap in there. 10 to the power 13 meters is from here to the sun. That tube might as well be infinite space as far as that proton is concerned. Okay. It, it's just, yeah. So the proton is acting as a wave, even though you know it's localized. Delta X, delta P, Heisenberg uncertainty relationship allows you to sort of understand that that particle. So when you come in and they come in as a wave, they scatter as a wave. These scatter as particles into a detector. You say, yeah, but that also happens when you do quantum mechanics. They scatter because you collapse the wave function at the detector. You still count the number per unit volume entering. The split second you put the detector and detect it, it's it's a spherical wave, but the prob now it's the probability of landing in that detector at some angle. So it's wave, 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 wave. And it's got to be a plane wave. You guys have had enough quantum mechanics to know this. Why is it a plane wave? It's a plane wave because definite energy and momentum is associated with a plane wave, right? Why is that true? That's true because delta X, delta P. If you know something to an extremely sharp value of momentum and delta X, delta P, no matter how small on the other side is a small number, if you know delta P extremely well, delta X, delta P is some number. What has to be true about delta X? It's huge, right? Complete uncertain like a complete, to quote the great Bob Dylan, like a complete unknown, like a, thank you. I was not going on until somebody looked it up on Google. So that means it's fully, that means you don't know where it is. Yeah. And now if it's one dimension, you kind of know it's in one dimension. Now, you know, if it's nowhere, what is it? The probability to be anywhere is like one is not like it's one. Now it's not quite because you know it's in the two. It's quantum mechanics. Okay. So it's a plane wave. A plane wave extends like a mine everywhere. So it's coming in like this, hits this thing. Keep that in mind when you take quantum mechanics. Nobody was there to teach me, so I didn't understand a single thing about scattering. There's a couple of things that have perplexed me completely that I thought I was in over my head and I was never going to. That was one of them the first time I saw the scattering diagram. E to the IKZ plus F of theta, psi of what the, what the hell does that mean? No clue. All right, so it goes like this. And what we will do is define, again, we need an intensive quantity. We need something that's per unit. I have a detector, and if I've given this talk in here already, forgive me, I'm conflating this in modern physics right now. The probability to end up at a particular angle, a particular 
right at that value. Have I had this discussion with you? Okay. I'm doing this because I'm a theorist and I did not understand scattering, believe it or not, until I understood the experiment. So for us as a theorist, we go theta. There's no, there's no such thing. That's an, there's no such thing. That's like me asking you to pick a real number between zero and one. What's the probability of you getting it? Zero, because there are an infinite number. Uh, there's infinite of numbers. What's the way to say that? There's an infinite number of numbers between zero and one. However, if I asked you pick a number between zero to 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, I have a one in 10 chance, right? The detector is that binning into, into gaps because there is no detector that will detect anything. What's First of all, what's the probability of going any one particle to go into a single point? It's zero. There's no number one. That's theoretically. Operationally, what's true about any detector you strap up there? It's got a physical size. It's got an opening, right? So we're counting the number that goes into this theta in this little d theta. And you'll see on the picture, figure five, has that very thing. The other thing I want to tell you is this. There are two angles, and this and the cross section will define this way. Let me get this first. Sigma omega, d omega, capital omega, is the number scattered per second. Why per second? Because that's an intensive quantity. All of us can agree. Even if I have a different experimental setup, it will all come out on the wash. Number scattered per second divided by the incident flux, I. Let's talk about each of these in turn. You know I had trouble with the subject when I break it down this to this detail. You know I had trouble with the subject when you see me thinking it down to the baby steps. So what is the incident flux? The incident flux. I don't understand everything. Is the number crossing per unit area, some area, I won't say per unit, per time. Number per unit area, per unit time. That's the incident flux. You might remember this expression in the old days of undergraduate physics, J, N, V, number per unit volume times the velocity. Because when you do that, if you look at the number leaving the right-hand side here, the number leaving this, it's the number per unit volume times in here is that volume which is area, let's put it over here, area times delta x. The only ones that make it through the right-hand side are the only ones fast enough on the left to cover that distance delta t, so that's NEV. Well, if it's current, it's NEV. So this is N, and then you do both sides, you divide by the area, and that's N times V to get the current. So here's the probably as important as anything else I'll say. I put it right here, okay? There are two angles in this problem. Somebody had told me this, life would have been a lot easier for me. There's two angles in this problem. Number one is the scattering angle, capital theta. Number two is our friend theta in the spherical system, okay? Theta is measured with respect to the z-axis. So if I have a path, and I'm gonna redraw this picture, so I come in, here's V of R, here's the origin, put it right here, V of R. And I scatter through cap theta. The particle is here. This is the Z axis. There's theta. They're too different, okay? If it's the scattering angle is a physical angle in through which that theta is where the particle is. Little theta is where the particle is. And capital theta is the scattering angle. They may start to look very similar to each other asymptotically. But here's theta. Here's theta. Here's the particle coming in. So 
the small theta is off the z-axis, okay? So the scattering angle may be over here, but watch this theta. If you, yeah. Big theta is not a function of time. But small, Big, theta is. small theta is function is is the theta that we have, we used to call phi, okay? But now it's spherical coordinates, so it's theta. If you understand that, if you uh, if you keep in the in the front of your mind that there are two angles here, one will describe the orbital motion, which comes from the Lagrangian for this particle in this potential. In principle, everything is known from that. But we're doing an experiment that where we place a physical detector. This theta and this theta are two different things. Two different things. So the scattering has to do with this. I wish this lecture goes out into the world. I really hope this lecture goes out into the world. Because this is this is the crux of the issue that much better, smarter people than me don't explain because they just assume that, oh yeah, that's obvious. Oh yeah? Wasn't obvious to me. Maybe it was obvious to you, but it certainly wasn't obvious to me. So this theta is the spherical coordinate angle that determines where that particle is. Where is it? It's theta measured off the z-axis. It's a hyperbola, right? That theta is referring to the hyperbola in this case. All right, for a central potential, for central potential, this is easy because this this right in here is azimuthally symmetric. Watch me for a second. Azimuthally symmetric means it comes in. It's the same all the way around. So when I look at that, when I try to get that little solid angle, it's 2 pi. And then there's no R in here because it's a solid angle. The solid angle is defined as the area divided by r squared. So the r squared drops out in this symmetric situation. So it's two pi sine, in this case, cap theta. It's over here, this solid angle. And we're measuring scattering angle that way. Sine theta, d theta. I probably should have picked, I probably should have picked a different. And this, if I had had d phi, d cap theta, just so I clean up this, this is d omega, okay? That's d omega. You're an electrical engineer, yeah? Of some sort. Did you special have a specialty in something? Photonics. Photonics. Okay, let me ask you, did you guys ever, as in part of your training, did you come across the solid angle? I never liked it, but I'm sure I know what this solid angle is. Never liked it? Didn't care for it. <laughs> Okay. I always prefer to break it up into Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. It was it's it's it confused me more than it helped. Yeah. It really did. I when when somebody said, look, let's just break down this little piece of area and then ask how much it goes through. I said, ah, okay, great. Well, this is the solid angle. You take that and divide. Uh, we can stop when I understand. Let's let's stop while I understand something. Let's just stop here before we proceed on to confuse me even further. So as I say earlier, if you read the notes, you'll say that something I've already said, which again, we're in spherical coordinates. And let me remind you, it's two angles, right? Theta and scattering. So the particles scatters here, but thetas. Eventually, you can kind of see in that picture they would merge. All right. So what are the appropriate kinematic variables to do this? So now we're doing physics, not just geometry. Are you ready for the train of the physics train? Choo choo choo, just like loft or the physics dump truck, like Lofty and uh, Bob the Builder. You don't have kids, do you? <laughs> okay. So let's now talk about the physics. We still have a central force. What's the first quantity we discussed that was conserved in a central force potential? Starts with an A. Angular momentum. Angular momentum. So we the angular momentum, let me draw the picture again, comes in like, so this is the impact parameter S. And here's my potential right there. So the angular momentum relative to that is really simple. L is equal to the mass of the particle, the incident speed, times S. And I will remind you 
this is equal to, let's do it again, E is one half m v naught squared. So the we can once we know the initial speed, we have one half m v naught squared. This gives me two m naught e square root is equal to v. So the angular momentum l is equal to the impact parameter s times the square root of two m e. Box that up. Second sort of postulate of this. For every S, there is a unique path. To the detector. It, what I should do the way I did in the notes, a unique the way I, it's a new unique path is equivalent to what I just said, a unique theta. Your second, M from L. Yeah, Your second what? L is M V S. L is M V not S, right? And you just plug in V for L I dropped your other M. I did? I don't believe you. Then the square root of two M E. Yeah. For v. Oh, it should be a, there what should be in there? Outside. Now you can make it MQ if you want. Yeah, that's too much trouble. All right, let's go through it again. Since I've, apparently I can't do it. So MV naught. L is definitely this, right? Oh, yeah, you can just find MQ. Right? So E is one half MV squared. So I multiply here by M, and that's M squared, correct? Oh, sure. Yes? Then I multiply through by two. Yep. And now I have that. Then I take the square root, square root, m v naught. Then I multiply by s. And then I get l, which is s. Sorry, Dr. Ensinoso, I thought you were a doddering old fool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we all do we let me ask you this. Do we agree that L then is equal to S times two M E square rooted? Do we agree with that? Did I have that originally? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did I box it? Yes. That comp box of confidence, that's what that was. All right. So for every S, there is a unique theta. And that has to do with the nature of F equal MA and the deterministic, the deterministic properties of classical mechanics. If you give something a, a position and a velocity, it has to result in a unique path. You can't cross because the initial conditions specify a path deterministically according to Newton's laws. So if I give it a different initial position with the same force, I am going to give it a unique path, which means a unique theta. Where does this break down? In other words, this, these two have will never merge to the same path. They'll have unique. Now, asymptotically, they'll go into a small delta theta, but they must be unique because of the nature of the second order differential equation you are solving to get a path. Given a different initial condition, you get a unique path. Okay. Second thing that breaks down where when you do this problem quantum mechanically. Because when you do this problem quantum mechanically, again, we're not dealing with pet with straight lines coming in, right? What are we coming in with? Yes. Waves. And we are no longer detecting a path up here. We're determining a probability to be found in that detector. Where are you guys in quantum mechanics right now? Wave functions? Hermitian operators? A dagger A? No, we haven't got there yet. But... Or you're close. Yeah, yeah. We, we just started talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Study those things. Those things look trivial. Study them hard because you. Study them. Make sure you know what the heck they are. Okay, so we have that. So for every S and E, there is a unique theta. That allows me to establish this relationship. 2 pi I. This is, again, the incident flux. It crosses. This is... Check the units. That'll build your intuition. We'll do that in a second. Let me write it down, and then we'll come back and build it. Oh, sorry. Again, 
incident flux. Is it possible to get the same theta with different S's and E's? Yeah, but you run the experiment one E at a time. It doesn't make any sense to come in with different E's. You want to come in, you want to study the... Yeah, I agree with that. But classically, it's meaning it's it, you're gonna. The, my guess is I don't. I'm not an experimental physicist. My guess is any uncertainty you have in the energy here is washed out with a with the resolution of the detector. This is what I think probably would happen. Also, you can get energy classically seriously precise. You can filter it out. You can filter after filter after filter till you get the resolution of energy one part and God knows what. Quantum mechanically as well. I mean, with these part with these pro, and, and in that case, it doesn't really matter all that much. But you know, these guys are coming down there at one TE TE worth of s ten to the power, you know, twelve or whatever the hell it is in in EVs. Okay, so you're an EV off, you know, <laughs> you know. So okay, you're an EV off, but you can really get these things precise. I was hoping Doctor Stroy ever walked by. I had a question for him about this, but because I don't know exactly. It comes to the fact that we detect one particle. Later on, we're going to do the center of mass frame. One particle, though, has privilege, Michael. The, the, the projectile is the privileged particle because the target we don't care that much about generally. But there are cases where you do what are called, I think, coincidence experiments where you detect both particle and second particle. And then you kind of line them up to really get a lot of information about what's going on, but we're not doing that right now. So the incident flux, let's talk about why these two things are going to be the same or why we can define a cross-section this way. I'm doing my best to do that. Th Let me see. Is there a better way to do that? I'm going to use that one. You see, look at my new symbol. You see my new symbol? It's got a line that penetrates the... The e I the too. Have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hey, don't, don't never like it. Don't care for it. This is the big one. And now it looks like Saturn. Okay, it looks like Saturn. Okay, you use the cross. All right. Well, you're you bring your religious beliefs in, into this room at your own. Per okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's do theta. I sine theta. Oh, I like it much better now. Theta. Okay. But I'm going to need some self-discipline here. I think I have it. And I take absolute values because these are numbers. You're counting things. D theta can be positive or negative depending where you are. Lots of things can be positive or negative. Like DS can be positive or negative depending if you come above or below. But we're always looking in terms of positives because we're counting things. So let's see if this is, makes sense. What this is on the left-hand side is the number that come in per second. How do I know that? Because this is, as I said, incident flux. That's number per unit area per unit time. If I multiply by this ring, so this is the number that are crossing through this ring. Ah, shoot. I had it in my head so magnificently, and then I drew the ring, and it came out like garbage. That is the number that crossed through that ring, SDS. Those get scattered, pop, 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 and detected. The particles don't go away. We're not dealing with absorption or inelastic scattering. That tells me I can define the cross-section this way. Again, I will remind you, okay, this is number per and you expect the result to be proportional to the incident. So that's just, I just wrote it on both sides to keep it self-consistent. Again, the units here are number per unit time per area. This is dimensionless. This is dimensionless. So I need something with the area. And that something with the area is known as the differential scattering cross-section. They, you see how this is carrying the role of area here? It's a distance times a distance, right? impact parameter over here that has units of area that is the defining quantity and i will remind you this is an experiment this is experimentally robust the geometry looks like this it's in figure six that we're about to analyze here's what happens somebody 
has to explain this to oh i mean well you guys are all smarter than me but somebody has to explain this to you or you spend hours trying to figure out what's going on here hours luckily you don't have to so the part this thing will come in like this this is figure six i mean let me before i'd give i don't like i'm not a picture thinker so let me finish with my equations so you see sigma theta just a quick division on both sides is s over sine scattering angle ds d theta if you're worried about the rigor of the absolute value of ds d theta think of it in terms of deltas and not d's think of it in terms of an operational in an operational way where you're doing the experiment what is this sigma stand for again scattering angle oh sigma's cross section I'm going to tell you, let me tell you now, so I don't, okay. It's the cross-section associated with scattering. It's the area that, here I, here I come as a projectile, okay? Put your hand in the air like you don't care where it up. No, I got to face me, okay? So I'm, I'm the projectile, right? Mm -hmm. I'm coming in at this energy. At this energy, I barely see anything, okay? Mm -hmm. At this energy, I hit it. Mm -hmm. At this energy, I really smash it and I back off. At this energy, I miss it. That cross section tells me how much area I see when I come in. It's the air effective area for scattering. Quick, quick test, right? Okay. Hold up a sphere. Spheres. <laughs> now hold it in your hands. Be the sphere, Danny. Andrew, be the sphere. Be the sphere. Be the sphere. <laughs> cradle it. Cradle it, Danny. Cradle it. Danny from Caddyshack. Are you cradling this here? Okay. So I'm coming along here. Bam. What do I see? What's the, what's the cross section? The cross section. Pi r squared. Yeah. It's pi r squared. Right. Okay. That's what it is, basically. That's all it is. Okay. If I come at a higher angular momentum, I come at a really high angular momentum, what cross section do I see? Zero. Okay. So it's the area that the effective area that you'll scatter off when you come in as a projectile. That's what that sigma. But it's more subtle than that. Unfortunately, it's more subtle than that. Because it's not just the area I see, it's the area specifically. You're doing an excellent job. Is it is the area I see to go in this angle right up here? So here, nothing. Here, nothing. I'm coming faster and I go in. So it's the probability for all intents and purposes to be scattered into that angle and that small little, thank you. You did an excellent job, but you did not cradle the sphere to the extent that my imagination would allow me to yes, grasp it. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see, in, in boxing, you do a sphere, kind of a sphere drill. When you're using, like shoe shining, shoe shining is when you're punching, you kind of have in your head when you're doing drills, a sphere. It's from yesterday, it on. Yeah. <laughs> good day yesterday okay i didn't get hit so that's a good day so that is all right so let's look at this here's our here's our diagram we'll break this down piece by piece i assure you so the particle will come in again figure six i'm not going to be as good as the figure so there's the particle coming in first of all what i do know is this if this is b Asymptotically, this will be B by conservation of angular momentum and elastic scattering. But I'm not going to draw that in right now. That's also B. Here's the other thing I know. This thing, and this is what really, you start to have to really, this thing is symmetric. I didn't do the best job in the world. Let me, let me, I knew I wouldn't be able to do that. I lack confidence, conviction. I wasn't bold, Michael. Okay. Much better. So this is the point of closest approach. I'll call that RM. Okay. Closest approach. What do I know about this path relative to RM? It's not immediately apparent, but I'm going to tell you it's symmetric about that point. Here's how I know that. Because if I were to run this experiment backwards, in other words, I were to release it from there, what would happen? It would go through the same exact path, right? 
In other words, all I would have to imagine is having a videotape of this experiment, put it in reverse. If I have this classical path, it's unique. I could retrace it all the way back and it has to be symmetric around the point of closest approach RM. And again, if you don't, you don't like it, have a good look at the picture. It's going to be better than mine. Maybe, let, hang on, let me, let me do this a little bit better. Where would it be in this picture? Okay. Was it about right? Oh! <laughs> Is there an undo? Ah! Okay. I think it's here. I think it's there. Yep. So that's RM. And now we have an RM established. Here's what else I know. If this is my potential, this dot right here, the scattering angle will be over here. So here's theta, cap. Mm -hmm. By symmetry, this is psi and this is psi. Now, why in the world are you having to throw all this geometry at it? This is my, the reason, okay, you have to throw all this geometry at it. My question, and I can remember it 40 something, over 40 years ago now, I already know what the path is. Why do I need to do it this way? You would think something, it would be one of these laws, but really it comes down to just operationally, the way you want to, it, it turns out this problem is very difficult to do. In the general case, with the hyperbola formulation, you really want to put this angle. It really cleans everything up. Believe it or not, it does. It cleans everything up. All right. So how do I get? So let's talk about this. So what is psi? You'll see me say in the notes, the rest of this problem relies on formalism. We've already established. It's going to look very different, but it is the same formalism. Okay. So in our case here, I have theta is equal to start here go here, there's theta. Then I go psi, then I go another psi, and I will have theta is pi minus one psi minus a second psi minus two psi. Yeah, I agree with you. Huh? There is no small, oh, small theta would be that's capital theta. It's a scattering angle. The, by the way, you just answered the question why I made such a big damn deal out of this, right? There's two angles in this problem. Both of you just answered it. By asking the question, where's theta? Which theta? This is the scattering angle. Theta in this case, by the way, is measured off of... Please don't erase everything. Theta is measured off the z-axis. So theta... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a bunch of thetas in for you. Are you ready? So when this thing is far away, theta is almost pi. When this is here, here's theta. This is now we're talking about little theta. Yeah, we're talking about little theta. Yeah, <laughs> big theta, little theta. Yes, thank you. Um, what's a better way to say a big theta, little theta? Just the theta Hyperbolic theta. Yeah, junior, theta, junior. Theta junior. So that's theta junior. That's the spherical coordinate theta. I don't want to have this as a mouthful. Spherical, I don't want to say that every time. But it's theta junior. Okay. You see, they're very different, right? Notice that after this over here, theta, they start to get to the same spot, huh? Yeah. You see, asymptotically. You know what asymptotic is? When, when Rutherford first ran this experiment, asymptotic was about this much. Because the detector was here, it was a thin gold foil. I think the foil was about this big, and he ran be beams coming in, and it's right over here. Change the world, man! Change the world with that experiment, huh? So that's theta minus two psi. So now you will hear me refer to this as the accumulation of theta begins from far away. So. Where does, how does accumulation, and this is a word, I think I'm the only one in the history of mankind who's taught this to use this phrase, accumulation of psi, rather, starts here. Watch the screen, please. Watch the screen. So the accumulate right here, psi is asymptotically psi is zero, right? So the accumulation of psi 
starts here, 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 here. It builds up, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. Now you're there, okay? So the accumulation of size starts at R at infinity. And you can actually, you can put in theta. It doesn't matter in this case because little theta junior is equal to pi in that case, right? You see the difference in the angle, why you have to have the two angles straight in your head? You see the two angle, you really need those straight in your head. And that ends at R min. It ends here. Once I have it there, the rest of it is the same on the other side. It's the same on the other side. So why do I call it an accumulation? Everybody tells you this and nobody explains it. I'm going to explain it to you right now. Temporarily. I'm going to draw this picture up. Temporarily, this is the z-axis. This angle, psi, is the same as theta when we did this problem with little theta. That's the reason you can use the formula that I'm about to write down now. It's the same formula that we had that Nora asked me about. We had d phi is equal to L, bop, 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 and we had d rho equal to E minus, bop, bop. remember all that? It's the same formula. So it can be the same formula. That referred to a specific coordinate system with z this way and phi this way doesn't matter. It's the same one. It's just now, if you think about it correctly, your Z is here. Think of your Z as being that axis that splits psi into two. Psi below it and psi above it. And that is the same. That psi with that particular axis that I've written through RM is the same as the old Z axis for little theta and rho. We called it for phi before, but now we're calling it theta. Remember phi was this for us because we had Z is equal to zero. Now Z is here, but it's the same deal. That's our Z axis and that's theta. And that's the same as our old phi as measured off uh, in the plane. So that allows me to write psi. Its accumulation starts where? Its accumulation starts, I have, I've changed the sign. So from RM, you can do it on each side, any side you want. DR, this was D row previously. R squared, 2ME, a formula we've already seen before over L squared. If you don't feel like writing this down, I'm completely okay with that. But we can split it up. We've already seen this. And I'm going away from U back to V. Minus L squared over R squared. It looks a little bit different, but I'm trying to stick with Goldstein. All right. At no point, and, I, and, and if someone finds it, tell me. Someone tell me. How do you get RM? How do you get RM? How do you get the minimum approach? I dare you to go find where he tells you how to do that in Goldstein. I dare you. It's not in there. And if I'm wrong, I'll apologize. I think he's dead. We'll have a seance and I'll apologize to the spirit of, I think, Herbert Goldstein. I think his wife. Huh? No? You don't have to? You think he'll be okay with it? I think he'll be okay with it. He's dead. What does he care? All right. Yeah, you got your book. <laughs> huh? He, uh, he sold a bunch of books when that was a lucrative endeavor. Now it's a money-losing proposition. You make about 40 cents. I thought about doing one. Uh, general relativity for dummies. I thought about writing one. And then I realized that, you know what? I'm going to end up making about 50 cents an hour. It wasn't worth it. How do you get RM? It's the distance of closest approach. The way you do it is to look when T plus V is equal to E, all right? You evaluate T plus V is equal to E, correct? You remember, that's why I made a big damn deal about that graph the other day, a few days ago. Remember when the E was coming in? That closest approach is off that graph, okay? Yeah, so that... When turning points is basically when it's basically when essentially dr d theta in this case is equal to zero because you come in this again came back to your question of where are those turning points which is why i put a link up so you could go look at them you come in so the the negative one is coming in and the so here's r 
as a function of psi, essentially, or here's R as a function of theta. R, 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 okay? So you come in and you go out. So that comes out to be, we'll stop here. Let me just write this down real quick. This will give me, actually, this is a homework problem, so I'm not going to work it out. Okay, so I'm not going to work it out. It's just a jerk move by me. So DRD theta is what we're going to have to work out. And I'll quote it next time, plus or minus. All right, uh, of course, I'm over. Let me make sure we're clear. The first three homework problems, and I'm going to go back and amend the notes so you'll see the dates, are on Monday. Does someone have the text open with them? Does someone have the text with them and open? No, I want to actually know the problem. Thank you, yes. Mr. Daughter, do you remember the, the we were standing, I was standing here, you were standing there, and I said there's I would rather over explain really basic things and allow you to you saw one of the most prime examples of me over explaining really basic things. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and not moving on to the next point immediately. Yeah. What are the problem numbers? Uh, what's the second? Not forget the derivations. Go to the problems and look at the second one. Yeah, I think I it's number eleven or twelve. No, it can't be that few. Can someone look them up on the I knew you wouldn't be able to find them. They're too hard on the phone. Yeah, you know what? I have a really, really. What? I have Dorian. I have Dorian's book. From, this is probably from a library. Of Dorian. Thirteen and nineteen. I got it. You got it. Yeah. You had a problem. Yeah, the problem. Read the first one, Tim. Two particles move out each other in circular orbits under the influence of gravitational forces of the period tau. Their motion suddenly stops at the given instant of time, and they are then released and allowed to fall into the trunk. This is what's happening. Okay. Prove that they collide after some time. Huh? <laughs> do you know how to do it? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to let you think about that. Do you know how to do it? You got to think about it, right? <laughs> Give you a hint. First thing to do, get that time when they're still going in circles. How far do they go? Two pi what? Two pi the radius, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How long does it take? Tau. Then they stop. So that's one part. You got that in your pocket, right? You got a relationship between the gravitational force, because F equal MA, and then they stop. And then what do you do from here? What's the what's the main principle in the history of the physics? Conservation of what? Yeah. You can do this problem. Okay, what's the second one? Second problem. 13. A. Part A. Show that if a particle describes a circular orbit under the influence of an attractive central force directed toward a point on the circle. Then the force varies as the inverse fifth power of the distance. Here's the picture. You all look on the screen. There's the force center. So the particles here. This is where the, the potential, this is V of rho. Okay. The potential center is there. So here's phi. So you're trying to, you want to describe. You should start doing this problem. Well, I have no idea. I've never done it. Ah. <laughs> you should start. Actually, I have. I, I take it a pass. That I kind of know. You want to start this by writing the equation, the polar equation. Look, if you have a circle, look at this. Rho is equal to constant, right? Rho is equal to constant k. But this isn't rho is equal to constant. You have, if this is the distance a here, the radius a, rho of zero is 2a. Polar equation for it, right? Once you have that, then you can do differentiation with respect to phi, and then you can see everything come out. Yeah, I think so you can. That was only part A. Part What's part B? So that for the orbit described, the total energy of the particle is zero. Yeah, you'd be fine. Okay. Because you know, you know, B, and you know the kinetic energy now, right? Think so. Yeah, it'll be fine. What's the third one? Right. Yes, in eleven. The particle moves in a force field described by this equation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
write the equations of motion and reduce them to the equivalent one. You can do that. You can do that. Yeah. I think I've only assigned part uh, A there. If not, I nope. will. What's part B? Uh, show that if the orbit is merely circular, the apt sides will <laughs> advance approximately by pi and rho over A. Per I don't even know what that is. So I'm pretty sure. I, that must be something. Is that an English word? I, yeah, I think it's just, it was probably Greek at one point. Got it. Either of two points on the orbit that are nearest to or furthest from the body. Oh, the, the apogee and the perigee. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's also known as the apsis. It's the plural of apsis. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, I learned something today. The apoapsis and the periapsis. Okay.